Good evening. It is good to see all you once again. If you open your Bibles, you may be making your way to Ephesians, the sixth chapter. That's where we're beginning tonight. Ephesians chapter six. Appreciate Tom leading those songs before the lesson, especially the one we just sang, for it relates directly to what we're going to be talking about tonight as we begin a series of lessons on the armor of God. Uh, Again, just for note, I'll be reading from the 1995 update of the New American Standard. Um, this series of lessons has come from, well, I can't really tell you how many years of study on this, of just not constant, but it has come up time and time again, reading several, read several books, dug deep into this stuff, and I continue to study in and, and work on this stuff, but I have become convinced that all of us, every single Christian here and every, everywhere in the church, uh, we need to be reminded of these truths, uh, of, of the realities of spiritual warfare and what God has done to equip us to handle the battles that we are in on a day-to-day -day basis. Because as we lament, or some lament, how the culture is going back to, well, how, where the culture is going, you can look at the reverse side is that the culture is going back to how it was in the first century. And I look at that as a silver lining because the first century is when the church grew by leaps and bounds, and you could tell a Christian from a crowd. Uh, but what made them strong, and what made them distinct, and what made them victorious was they knew a thing or two about spiritual warfare and they knew how they knew how to equip themselves and what they need to do in order to uh, be victorious in those fights and so tonight we're going to be looking at sim uh, simply just Ephesians 6 10 through 13 and looking at the realities of spiritual warfare Paul in these four verses presents us with four realities uh, four things that we need to wrap our heads around if we're going to be victorious when it comes to our own spiritual battles. And some of this will be a preview of coming attractions, and we may deal with it superficially tonight, and if Lord wills, we will deal with it more in depth as we go through each part of the armor of God, and we look at each of those pieces and what it is, what it's all about, and what it does for us. So starting in Ephesians 6... We'll read these four verses, and then we'll start breaking the text down. Finally, be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in, in the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. So the first reality we need to come to grips with when we fight these battles and we are engaged in spiritual warfare is that we do not have the strength. In of ourselves, we are not capable and we do not have the strength to fight these battles. Hence why he, Paul says here, finally be strong in the Lord and his might. Um, I'm not going to venture into the Greek conjugations because I'm a danger to myself when I do that. But the authorities who know better than I have said that the conjugation, the tenses of the Greek text here indicate something that is present and continuous, and it indicates something that we receive, not something we gain. And so we must receive the strength that God gives if we're going to be victorious in this fight. Because if you look at the current self-help, the current trending books on your Audible or Barnes & Noble, there's a lot of talk about atomic habits and how to hack your willpower and how to hack brain chemistry and how to do all these things you might be able to force your way or will yourself through a temptation or two or to a spiritual victory or two, but sheer willpower alone 
is not sufficient to fight spiritual battles. It won't be. Because inevitably, it will lead to us trusting in ourselves, which will then be a form of idolatry or pride, and Peter's pretty clear about those who are prideful, God will bring low, and God will humble. So we must look for the strength which God supplies, as we just sung a moment ago. Again, he says, be strong in the Lord and his strength of his might. Notice the pronouns again. It's in him, in his strength, his might, his power. Not ours. Not ours. Because you and I could not go toe-to-toe with Satan. God can and did. And so when we, and this is the key to all this whole series, when we lean hard and fast and are completely and totally and utterly relying upon God for our all, our victory, our strength, our everything. That's when we have the victory. It's one of these paradoxes of live life in the kingdom is that we are, we are made strong when we are, quote, the weakest and totally dependent upon somebody else for our victory. And this is a connection that Paul had, the connection within Ephesians is clear. If you, if you just look at back at the beginning of the chapter, Paul prayed about Ephesians that they would know the power, the, the, they would be able to experience the power of God and his strength. In Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to be starting in verse 15, towards the end of this introductory uh, section of the Ephesian letter, he has just talked about the greatness of God's lavishing his grace upon us in Christ. That's verses 3 there through 14. He now begins in verse 15 this this commendation of the Ephesians and a prayer for them. He says in verse 15, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward those who believe. These are in accordance with the work, working of his strength and his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him with, at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age that is to come. Specifically, verse 19. In the middle of this prayer, Paul prays that the Ephesians would know the surpassing greatness of God's power towards those who believe. That power is the very same power that Paul connects to the resurrection and our salvation. That by the same power that raised Christ from the dead, we were raised from spiritual death into spiritual life. You know, he, he says as much in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14. This power of God is first experienced, this strength of God is first experienced in our own salvation. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, again, chapter 6, here in verse 14. Paul writes that not, now God has not only raised the, uh, the Lord, but also will raise us up through him, excuse me, through his own power or his own strength. And if you go back to Ephesians again, the way the Christian experiences this is not in some sort of sensory way, but through knowledge a understanding of the realities that are currently, well, that are, are the realities of what is real. There we go. Um, he prays first and foremost, if you look in verse 17, that the, Lord, the God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the, sorry, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father of glory may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that their eyes of their heart would be enlightened, so that they would know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of his glory and inheritance. Knowledge is transformative. Knowledge is power. 
Knowledge is safe. It's knowledge is strength. Um, TEP hasn't run a commercial like this in a while. Well, then again, I don't really watch a lot of television anymore, but TEP used to run these commercials about the, the, P, the public service announcement about down power lines. That down power lines, even when they're not sparking, they maybe it's live, and it's just a, what looks to be just a black cord on the ground. Okay, a child doesn't know that that has enough electricity to kill them. And TEP, what they did was they animated that black power line to show the danger of it as a rattlesnake. As we all directly understand that you, you don't go near rattlesnakes. Um, if I don't have the knowledge of the power or the strength that's inherent in, say, a down power line, I may go up and touch it or lick it um, to my detriment. But if I have that knowledge and I understand the power and strength that's there, I know to avoid it. Me knowing and not knowing about something doesn't change the fact that the reality is there. So being knowledgeable then through the scriptures about what God is doing on our behalf for us, in us, and through us is power, and it's a knowledge of the strength that God is giving through his providential care, through his blessings, and, and through his protection and, and um, answering and hearing our prayers. Going back to Ephesians 6 here, Again, if we need to understand that we, in ourselves, separated apart from God, cannot fight this battle. So the, the positive lesson from this first one is, I need to be completely clothed and wrapped in God and be relying upon him for my good, my all, and my strength. Secondly, we need to be equipped. Without God, we are simply running off in the battle naked. No protection, no armor, no weapons of any kind. Um, and so we need to be equipped. Now, this may seem semantics. That's not the right word. This may seem obvious to you, but when I discovered this, the light bulb went on and just my mind was blown. So we see we need the armor of God. And perhaps you're like me and it's thought, okay, yeah, it, it's the armor of God, okay? And I played the board game in Sunday school where we draw cards and we make the armor and I drew the picture and all that stuff. Okay, it's, it's the armor that God made for me to wear. That's not what he's talking about. He's, we need God's very own armor. When Paul goes through the armor of God, he quotes extensively from Isaiah about the descriptions about who God is and what he's wearing, about what, what the Messiah is going to do, and how the Messiah is clothed with power. And there's references to who, how God describes himself as. So, for example, the belt of truth. We're going to be in Isaiah for a little bit. In Isaiah chapter 11, in verse 5 here. Speaking of the Messiah or the, right, the, the branch of Isaiah. He says here in verse 5, well, let's, let's start in verse 4, just to get some feeling for the text. He says here, but with righteousness he will judge the poor, and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will, and he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath, the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt about his waist. Now Paul is quoting this verse from the Septuagint translation in Ephesians. He's quoting it something that the Old Testament prophets said, this is what the Messiah, or the chosen one, he is clothed with righteousness and truth. His loins are girded with this as a belt. So when we put on our belt of truth, it's not something that God has simply made and given to us, although that would be powerful in of itself. It is the belt that God himself has worn in these messianic pictures. How he is clothed in this righteousness. Secondly, the, bright, the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation also come from Isaiah. If you look in Isaiah 59 in verse uh, 17 there. In Isaiah 59 verse 17. 
again, another picture of the Messiah or God in the Old Testament. He says, he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. Again, it's the breastplate that God has worn. It's, it's the helmet that God has worn in the Old Testament prophets. You know, Isaiah 52 and verse 7, Paul also quotes it in Romans chapter 10 about those who proclaim the good news of the gospel. But in Isaiah 52 and verse 7, when Isaiah is giving a picture of the Messiah coming triumphantly, announcing the kingdom, he says, He lovingly, how lovely, excuse me, how lovely are the mountains, are the feet, excuse me, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of those who brings good news who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, and announces salvation and says, and says to Zion, your God reigns. Again, the feet of those who give bring good news. Again, Paul references to this. And then elsewhere, you know, the shield of faith doesn't have a direct quotation, but elsewhere in the scripture you have God referring to himself as a shield. In Genesis 15, verse 1, he says, Abraham, I am a shield to you. I will protect you. I will guard you. That's the imagery being used there. And then you have again in Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 2, that the sword, well, in Isaiah 49, verses 1 and 2, here the words of the Messiah are likened to a sword. Now, let's just turn there, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. Listen to me, O islands, and pay attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother he named me. He, he made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand he concealed me, and he also made me a select arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. In the beginning part of verse 2, he has made my, my mouth like a sharp sword. Now, let's, it's not hard to connect the dots of the scriptures. Christ himself is the word incarnate. That he talks about in Revelation, he will wage war with the unfaithful church. He will wage war with the words of the sharp sword of his mouth. Again, if the sword of the Spirit is the word of God and Christ is the word incarnate, it should not be surprising to us when God says that he has made the mouth of the Messiah like a sharp sword. He dispenses truth. God's truth. The truth. And I hope what we're seeing here, because we're going to go much more in detail in the coming weeks, Lord willing, but the armor of God is not something that Paul simply drawing out of thin air when he's writing this. Nor is he simply looking at a Roman centurion and thinking, well, that's a pretty good illustration. He's pulling on these images and these pictures that the prophets have been using, specifically Isaiah, for how to describe God and his righteousness and his his holiness and his vengeance and his purity and all those good things and all those great things about God. Paul's drawing on that imagery to make a point for you and me that when we fight these spiritual battles, we don't just need anyone's armor. We need God's very own armor, which he has given us to wear and defend and protect ourselves in in these spiritual fights, which goes to the third reality we need to come to terms with or come to grips with, is that this fight is bigger than we know. One of the worst effects of the Enlightenment upon the West is that it completely killed us as a culture, our understanding that there might just be a spiritual realm. And this shows up, even within Christian teaching, where we end up denying certain doctrines. Uh, case in point, the resurrection. Uh, some think that the resurrection is purely spiritual that there was no physical component whatsoever. Paul's very clear in 1 Corinthians 15, this body will be raised, and it will be joined with my spirit again, and it will be transformed into a body fit for heaven. There is a physical aspect of the resurrection. That we sometimes deny that spiritual forces are at work today. Uh, yes, the Bible is very clear that miracles to the human agency have ceased. Demon possession had a very specific purpose in the gospel age, and that has ceased. But nowhere does the scripture say 
that Satan kind of just gave up the spiritual war to fight for our souls. Now, where does the scripture say that? Look back in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. And this is a great verse that speaks very pointedly to our day and age. There's another great lie or trap that Satan gets us in is that we can believe we're fighting the Lord's battle when really he's deflected our attention on something that really does not matter. Illustration of this, in World War II, the Allies, we tried, we, we explored every single option. And I forgot the name of the magician, but the Allies did hire a United States magician to come over and come up with an illusion, and I mean this in my not magical illusion, but a sleight of hand trick, to make the Germans think that we were amassing troops more towards Norway than we were on, get, on England getting ready to invade Normandy. And how he did this was he designed cardboard cutouts and inflatable tanks that from aerial shots looked like the real thing. Sometimes Saint does that to us, where he'll put up a false front over here to make us think that's where I need to be fighting when we've left this flank completely exposed. And that's so much I would submit to you what Paul's saying here. Paul reminds the Ephesians in verse 12 that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness. Rulers, powers, world forces, it's all qualified with this darkness against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Paul's saying, Christian, your fight is not against Nero. Your fight is not against your governor. Your fight is not against the law of the land. Your fight is much bigger than that. Your fight is against forces you can't even see with the naked eye. I think of Elijah when one of the prophet's attendants was lamenting and bemoaning the fact that they weren't going to survive or they, they were going to lose this battle, and Elijah just prayed, Lord, please open his eyes. And the attendant saw the, the host of the Lord's army surrounding the city and how they were not going to lose. And just why the scriptures don't give us a comprehensive view of the, this reality of these spiritual fights, it does give us glimpses. Something, one of the questions I have, and I don't think I'll get an answer until I get to heaven. I have a list, by the way, of questions that I'm going to ask God. Um, I wonder if I'll get the chance, but I, I figure I'd just get them ready while I'm, while I'm here on earth. One of them is just, what was going on with the angel and the prince of Persia in the book of Daniel? You know, we'll turn over to Daniel chapter 10, and it's interesting because Daniel doesn't go into detail. It's a passing, it's a passing detail in the book. In Daniel chapter 10, looking at verse, starting verse 12, of the angelic messenger, Daniel writes, Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel. For from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me twenty-one days. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to give you an understanding what will happen to your people in latter days for the vision that pertains to the days of the future." The angelic messenger feels no obligation to explain what just happened. He just shows up and says, sorry I'm late, I was busy, but it's all good now because Michael came and helped me and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go. Now, I need you to know, God heard you the first day, there was a bit of traffic with this Prince of Persia guy, but I'm here now. But as soon as the angel gives him understanding, it's interesting in verse 20, then he said, do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to, to fight against the prince of Persia, so I'm going forth, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. Angel gets delayed, shows up, tells Dan what he needs to go, what needs to know, and says, 
by the way, I gotta go, because I gotta get back to work. Jael just accepts it. I'm not, I'm not faulting for that. I think Daniel showed more faith and acceptance of the spiritual realm and spiritual realities than perhaps you and I would have. I think if I was in Daniel's shoes in this day and time and that happened, I would go, hold on, my, my, my Bible question can wait. Who's the prince of Persia? What are you doing? What's going on? And of course the angel would say, it doesn't concern you. Here, about the understanding of the vision, okay? This is what you asked about. Anyway, going down the rabbit hole. But then you have the book of Revelation. Now, I'm going to try and cram apocalyptic literature in one minute. All you need to know about the type of literature Revelation is, its goal is to give its readers dual vision. That is, you're going through these, these events on earth. They are not meaningless. They correspond with events in the heavenlies. There's something bigger going on that's affecting things on earth. That there's these two, they're connected. Just as the body and the spirit and soul are connected, so the heavenlies and the earth is connected. So you look in Revelation chapter 12 here. Now, on my superficial reading, I believe this corresponds with the events of Christ's death and subsequent resurrection. But... Again, that's left up for debate, but there is a corresponding here. So you look in Revelation 12, starting verse 7. And there was a war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon, the dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who was called the devil, and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now that salvation and the power of the kingdom of God, of our God, and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. He accuses them before God day and night. The only reason why I think this corresponds with the death and resurrection is because, very clearly in verse 10, the kingdom has arrived. Salvation has come. That happens after the cross and the resurrection. But that's a sub-point. What we need to understand here is that earthly events sometimes correspond with great spiritual battles that are taking place. And then sometimes, I mean, a tie between the earthly and the spiritual, sometimes it's all earthly. Paul's speaking about false prophets in 2 Corinthians 11, 14 through 15. It says, basically, my paraphrase, it's to be expected because no one, I mean, Come on, guys. I mean, Satan disguises himself as one of the good guys. And his messengers do the same thing. You know, that's the thing about false teaching, for example. If it came right out and said and stayed its logical conclusion when it walks in the, in the congregation, no one would believe it. Right now, there's this moronic heresy called realized eschatology back to you. All you need to know is they claim that Jesus and the second coming happened in 70 AD. And the tactics of these false teachers is they'll come into a congregation and they'll start asking pointed questions, probing questions. They'll start suggesting things. Because they know if they came right out and said, by the way, everything's done, there's no hope for your future, no one would believe them. No one. It's like Calvinists, if they actually stated outright what the logical conclusion of the doctrine is, is you might be saved, you might not be saved, so don't worry about it, go do whatever. No one would believe that. But that's a logical conclusion. But Paul's comparing these teachers to what Satan does. He disguises, there's deception, there's lies, there's false walls, and false fronts. Have there is a very real real war in the spiritual realm, and the fight is bigger than we know. One helpful tactic, because I, I want this lesson to still be practical. 
if we're a- when temptation comes, if you're able to take a deep breath and step back and reframe very quickly, I have found a helpful question to ask myself when temptation comes is what good is Satan trying to prevent me from doing right now? Because there has to be a reason why this is coming right now at this moment. Maybe I'm thinking too highly of myself. But Satan doesn't want us to do our jobs. Satan doesn't want us to be healthy, thriving Christians. And so if, you, if he can get you to doubt or give in or start spiraling in a circle of shame or, or double think or anxiety, he's won. He doesn't even need you to sin necessarily. He just needs you to sit on the bench. So if I could ask myself, what good, what is Satan trying to prevent me from doing right now? I have found that to be a very helpful tactic in saying, it, it forces me to look for the good. And it forces me to start getting active. But because we need to rely on the strength of God, and because the battle is bigger than we, we can imagine, and because of the things we've covered, we need to prepare. Paul, in, again, the 13th verse here, Ephesians 6. He said, therefore, based on what he said, there's a conclusion here before he dives into a, a greater discussion here on the armor of God. He says there in Ephesians 6, in verse 13, therefore, take up the full armor of God, so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. We need to, because we need to rely on God's strength and in his armor, and this battle is a very real spiritual battle that we are fighting, Paul double downs again. The armor of God is not simply a parade dress that you take days or um, really hard fights. You don't just pack it along just in case. It's put on every single day. Every single day. Because if we go out with it without it, it's like leaving your house without putting pants on. It might be acceptable at Wal- by Walmart by some people, but you, you don't walk out with without your pants on, or without being clothed. And just as ludicrous it would be to see somebody without their pants on at Walmart, it looks just as silly when a Christian runs out to do their day having not put on their armor. I believe that's why Paul doubled down. He doubled downs here on why we need to put this on. And the second thing about this verse, notice in the middle there, so that. If we don't equip ourselves with the armor, we will not be able to resist in the evil day. The armor is central to our fight against temptation. Very quickly, let's just hit the high points on this armor. So he says in verse 14, having girded your loins with truth, and we put on the breastplate of righteousness. You know, this year, friends of mine convinced me to go to the Arizona Renaissance Festival. Um, and so everybody else was having a costume. I thought, well, I can't be the only one looking normal. Amazon's great. You buy a twenty-dollar tunic, and I got to experience for the first time how annoying it is to have an ankle-length tunic. You can't you can't take very large steps in those things. And so I got some practice, bunching up all the extra material, and girding it around my loins so I can actually walk. It's a very hands-on experience. I don't recommend spending 20 bucks so you can experience that. Maybe you can borrow mine and try it out. <laughs> um, but the idea is when you're gathering all that extra material and you're wrapping it around yourself, and you're tying it so you're ready for work, you do that with God's truth. It permeates your life. It's Deuteronomy 6. That the words of this law shall not depart from your mouth for you shall teach them diligently when you rise up, when you sit down, when you walk by the way. They shall be as uh, frontals on your, on your head and your arms and on your doorposts and in your homes. It permeates everything. 
that's one thing you do to done everything to stand firm is making sure you're in the word secondly having put on the breastplate of righteousness i've heard two views on this and i don't think it's either or i think it's both and i think it is both trusting in the righteousness of christ which we are clothed in galatians 2 20 and and galatians chapter 3 and us being baptized into christ I think it's primarily what it is, but it is also a righteous life as a result of understand the grace that has been given to us. That protects the most vital organs. They, thank God that my salvation, my, my salvation is not dependent upon myself. It's dependent upon the work of Christ. And the more to the degree I trust in him for everything, is to, to the degree that I can live a victorious Christian life. Having shod your feet, in verse 15, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It's interesting, Paul in Romans 10 will quote the rest of the verse about bringing good news to people, but Paul does not quote that part of the verse here in Ephesians 6. He just says, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Shoes in the ancient world did not have traction. Your sandals, it was just leather that got smoother with time. And so for a soldier, his sandals were studded so that when he was fighting, he could dig in his heels and stand firm. I would suggest to you that is what Paul is saying here when we shot our feet with the gospel. We stand firm on the truths of what the gospel teaches so that when Satan does attack, we are not moved from those truths. So what truths are those? Some helpful ones. You are no longer a slave to sin. You are a slave to righteousness. You have been purchased with the blood of Christ. You, are not, you do not have a spirit of slavery or fear again, but you have a spirit of adoption by which you cry out, Abba, Father. You were once in the kingdom of darkness, but you have been translated the kingdom of his beloved Son. To remind yourself of those truths in the thick of the fight helps you to dig in. Say, that's not who I am. That's the old me. I, I stand firmly rooted in what the gospel has told me who I am. I'm a child of God. I've been redeemed and purchased with the blood. I will not renounce that. And then taking up the shield of faith. Trusting in God's faithfulness to us should also elicit faithfulness to him. That's a protection when Satan attacks. And taking the helmet of salvation, knowing like what Paul said in Philippians 1, 1, or Philippians chapter 1, that he who began a good work in you will see it through to the day of Christ Jesus. Knowing that God's not going to give up on you. That has immense comfort in our fights. And taking up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, we have girded ourselves with truth, and now we fight with truth. When Satan attacks, we like, his, like Christ's son, we attack back with the truth. You defend with the shield, and you counterattack with Scripture, with what God has said, not with what Satan is saying, what if. But every one of these things will go into more detail. But I suggest to you, each and every one of these things is part of what Paul means when he says, having done everything to stand firm having done everything to stand firm. If you're here tonight and you're not in Christ, if you're not clothed with him, Paul wrote in Galatians, the third chapter, again, he's writing to Christians here, but it teaches an important truth about our salvation. In Galatians chapter 3, He says to the Galatians in verse 26, You're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Well, why did, how is that possible? Verse 27, Because all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Maybe you've never done that, and you need to accept Christ this evening in the waters of baptism. We'd be happy to assist you. If I look out, I, I, know many, I, I think I know where you all stand. This is also a time for prayers of strength and encouragement. If you have sin that needs confessing, uh, won't you come as everyone stand and sing the song that's been selected? <laughs>